to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the walls began to shake the prison doors flew open at that very moment a jailer awoke realized his own fate and started to commit suicide but before he did he heard these encouraging words do yourself no harm for we are all here and upon the heels of that comforting statement the greatest question ever asked comes sirs what must I do to be saved. Acts chapter 16 and verse 30. Of all the questions that are asked in the Bible, none is of greater importance than this one. In fact, we can understand this question better if maybe we ask it by placing emphasis on the different words in the question. For example, we could ask, what must I do to be saved? This implies that salvation is active. It doesn't just happen. There's something I do to be saved. The scripture teaches that this is the case. As Jesus himself said, it's not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, that's going to heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Matthew 7, verse 21. Next, we would ask it this way. What must? I do to be saved. This teaches us that salvation is imperative. This is not a flippant matter. This is not a matter that you can take a lackadaisical approach to. This is imperative. Acts 9 verse 6, Saul asked the Lord, Lord, what must I do? What must I do? And he told him, you go in the city and be told you what you must do. There is a must in salvation. It's imperative. We could then ask it this way. What must I do to be saved. This teaches us that salvation is personal. You can't be saved for others. They can't be saved for you. You can't be saved on anyone's coattails. Salvation is an individual, personal matter. Romans 14, 12 teaches us why. So then, each of us shall give an account of himself to God. One day I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to stand there and give an account of what I've done individually in relation to the gospel. Then we can ask it this way. What must I do to be saved? Not get or not feel. What must I do? Jesus said in John 15, 14, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. He said in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. A lot of people say, well, did you get salvation or do you feel salvation? The scripture says, what must I do to be saved? And then that last phrase, what must I do to be saved? This teaches us that salvation is of eternal importance. We're talking about the most important matters ever. Your eternal destiny depends on how you answer this question. Jesus said if we answer it correctly, we can go away into everlasting life. Matthew 25 verse 46. But if we answer it incorrectly, there is a place called hell, and Jesus said it is a place where the worm never dies and the fire is not quenched. And so answering this question correctly, your eternal destiny depends on you doing that God's way. And so in this lesson, we're going to ask two questions. Number one, what must I know to be saved? And number two, what must I do to be saved? I know that it's important I understand the right things. For Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. The scripture says, do not be ignorant, but understand the will of the Lord. And so I've got to know the right things to be saved. Well, what things must I know to be saved? Number one, you've got to know that you're lost in sin without Jesus. The scripture says in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. As a result of that, Paul says the wages of sin is death. 
Romans 6.23 The soul who sins shall surely die. Ezekiel 18.4 The scripture says that God's ear is not shortened, that He cannot hear, His arm that He cannot save, but our iniquities and our sins have separated us from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 There is none righteous, no not one. Romans 3 and verse 10. And so to be saved, I've got to know that I'm lost in sin. I've got to know, secondly, that I can't save myself from this sin. Yes, I'm lost, and I can't save myself. Jeremiah 10 verse 23, the scripture says, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself, it is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Man cannot find his own path of salvation. We can't save ourselves. Jesus said in John chapter 6, some very, he, he taught some very difficult statements. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. He was talking about consuming his whole person into the being of his disciple, making sure they had the mind and the action of Christ. That statement was hard and the scripture says from that point on, some decided to walk with him no more. Jesus then turned to the others and said, Do you want to go away also? And here's what Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. John 6 verse 68. We need to come to the understanding, I can't save myself. I need to let God save me. I need to trust in the Lord with all my heart, lean not on my own understanding, acknowledge Him in all my ways, and He will direct my paths. Proverbs 3 verses 5 through 7. So many people get caught up in following what others say about salvation, what they've heard, what their parents may have done. Listen to what the proverb writer said in Proverbs 14 verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Don't do what you think is right. Do what you know is right based on Scripture. So I've got to know I'm lost in sin. I've got to know I can't save myself, and I've got to know only God can save me. If I'm going to be saved, it'll be by the grace of God. Scripture teaches we're saved by grace, through faith and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. The scripture teaches we'll be saved by the gospel of Christ. Romans 1 16, the gospel is God's power unto salvation. And thus we must receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. James 1 verse 21. The scripture teaches I'll be saved by obedience to the gospel. Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9 teaches that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey Him. And if I'm going to be saved by God, I'll be saved in His church. Acts chapter 2 verse 47, after they'd obeyed the gospel, the Lord added daily to His church, to the church. And so I've got to know I am lost in sin and I desperately need the gospel. I've got to know that I can't find my own path of salvation. No one can make it for me and that only God in His grace, His plan and obedience to His gospel can save me. Now let's answer the second question. What must I do? If I understand these things, what must I do to be saved? Again, it's important that I do something. John 7 verse 17, Jesus clearly taught that if we're going to do the will of God, we've got to know God's will. Acts 16 verse 30, what must I do to be saved? Well, what must a person do? In, in this part of the lesson, we're going to identify from Scripture exactly what God says a person must do to be saved. We're going to know what the teaching of that verse is, what the step is in God's plan of salvation, and show the verse that teaches that. And so what must a person do? Number one, you've got to hear God's Word. To be saved, you must hear the message of salvation from the Word of God. In the long ago, the psalmist said, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Psalm 95, verse 7. I know from Scripture that a faith is, is essential because the Scripture makes it abundantly clear. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so I've got to have faith, but how then do I get faith? If faith is essential, the process by which I get faith is essential. Now, how does that happen? And let's notice from the Scripture, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Notice the Bible says, So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing 
by the Word of God. If faith is essential, and it is, then whatever process by which I get faith is also essential to salvation. Well, how do I get faith? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by what? The Word of God. To be saved, you must listen to what God says concerning salvation. You know, sometimes we rush right through this first step, hearing the Word of God, and we jump right into belief. I think we make a grave error when we do that. I believe this is the most fundamental step in God's plan of salvation. What does it mean to really hear God's Word? I know it's got to be fundamental because the very next step is full-fledged belief and commitment to Jesus. Here's what hearing God's Word means. It means, first of all, that I recognize the authority of this book. Remember Mark chapter 9? Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on the high mountain. He is there transfigured before them. And Peter, because he's afraid and he doesn't know what to say, says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And do you remember what the voice of God said? This is my beloved Son. Hear ye Him. What does it mean to hear the Word of God? Recognize Jesus and the New Testament is the voice for salvation today. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. When I stand before God, I'm not going to be judged by what's on the New York list, the top seller list. I'm not going to be judged by what religious writers have talked about today. I'm going to be judged by this book. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not believe my word has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Understand clearly, this book, is the only authority in matters of salvation. And here's the good news. If you'll take it and do what it says and obey it, you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're right with God. And so number one, hearing God's Word means recognize the authority of Scripture. Secondly, it means that we've got to search and to seek and to prove that what we have heard is true to the Scriptures. Best example of hearing the Word of God correctly is found in Acts 17 verse 11. You remember the account. Paul goes into the area of Berea and the Bible says these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they searched the, and they received the Word with all readiness and searched the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Think about what happened. Paul comes into Berea and Paul knocks on the door and he says, I've got a message from God. Did they slam the door in his face? No. They said, Paul, we've heard some things. Come in. Let's sit down. Paul sits down. They sit down. Paul proclaims the gospel to them. They received it with readiness of mind. But what happened next? They said, boy, Paul, you must be right. We're going to accept that no matter what. They said, Paul, we've heard what you had to say. We've written it down. We've taken notes. We're going to search and see if that's true. They searched the scriptures daily to see if what they heard was true to the will of God. And friend, to hear correctly, we must do the same. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. Don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. And then to hear correctly, you must listen and realize the importance of careful hearing. Luke 8, 18, Jesus said, Take heed how you hear. Mark 4, verse 24, take heed what you hear. And in the words of Revelation 2 and 3, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. Make sure that you're hearing with the right motive. How? Make sure that you're hearing the right thing, the Word of God, and make sure that you're listening carefully on the most important subject of all, salvation. And so the first step in God's plan of salvation is to hear the Word of God. Secondly, a person must believe in Jesus to be saved. In Acts chapter 8, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are traveling down the road in the chariot. He's teaching the gospel. They get to a certain water. He says, hey, here's water. What doth hinder me? Do you remember the hindrance? If you believe with all your heart, you may. Notice the words of Jesus in John chapter 8 and verse 24. Belief is essential. And here's what Jesus himself said. Jesus said in John 8, 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am He, 
you will die in your sins. It is essential that I believe in Jesus. Uh, we're not saying that belief is not important. Belief is important. Belief is something I must have as part of salvation. But here's what's important. So many people stop right here. All you've got to do is believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. All it takes is faith only. I want you to listen very carefully. The word faith only or belief alone or the idea of faith alone occurs one time in Scripture and it says the exact opposite of what millions are teaching. Millions in the religious world say in answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? So I just believe in Jesus and that's it. The Bible uses that phrase one time and it is the exact opposite of what millions are saying. Now I want you to see it for yourself. James 2 verse 24, notice what the scripture says. The Bible says, you see then that a man is justified by works, and here it is, only time in scripture, and not by faith only. We, the religious world says, or those in the religious world say, you're saved by faith alone when God uses that phrase. God says you're not saved by faith alone. Now if I were really going to convince you that a person's not saved by faith alone, how would I do that? Well, I'd need to give some examples of people who believed in Jesus and were still lost. Well, let me give you four. John 1 verse 12, Jesus said to them that believe in Him, He gave the right to become sons of God. What does belief do? Make you a son of God? No. Belief gives you the right to become that which you still are not. Belief alone doesn't save. John 12, verse 42, the scripture says, Even among the rulers, many believed in Him, but because of the Pharisees, they weren't willing to confess Him. Question, can a person believe in Jesus, be unwilling to confess Him, and still be saved? Well, let's let Jesus answer. Matthew 10, verse 32, Jesus said, If you don't confess Me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. Here you've got people who believe in Jesus. They won't confess Him, and Jesus said they're not saved. Clearest example of all, John chapter 8, verse 30. As Jesus said these things, many believed in Him. Now in the same context, in verse 44, talking to those people who just believed in Him because they wouldn't commit their lives to Him, Jesus said, you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. I want you to think clearly about this. People have just believed in Jesus and Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. What does that teach me? I can believe in Christ and still be a child of the devil. Belief alone won't save anybody. How do we know that? James 2 verses 17 through 19. James said, you believe in God, you do well. Guess what? Even the demons believe and tremble. Are we ready to say that belief alone is the only step in salvation? We've got to say then that the demons are saved. Are the demons going to be saved? No. And belief alone, here's what belief alone will get you. The only thing belief alone will get you is a front row seat in the halls of hell right next to all the demons. Now someone said, well that's harsh, that's unkind. Friend, we're not saying those things to be harsh or unkind, but if someone's in sin, they need to know that. And if the Bible teaches belief alone won't save, we want people to know that is not what the scripture teaches. And if all you've done is believe, you are still lost. Now the third step, I must hear God's word, I must believe in Jesus as the Son of God, and I must repent of my sins. I want you to notice what Jesus said in Luke chapter 13 verse 3 and in verse 5. In the context, certain people have come to Jesus and it looks like they want to tattletale on others. Uh, what about these people had their blood mingled their sacrifice? Are they worse sinners than others? What about these people walking down the road and the tower falls on them? Weren't they worse sinners than everybody else? Jesus says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Acts chapter 3 verse 19, Peter proclaimed, Repent and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. When they asked that great question in Acts 2 verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What can we do to be forgiven of killing our own Savior? Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins.
But what is biblical repentance? Is biblical repentance just sorrow? I know it can't be that. For 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says, Godly sorrow produces repentance. Godly sorrow makes one repentant, but it's not repentant itself. A person can cry a bucket full of tears and still not repent. Sorrow is a part of that, but that sorrow makes us repent, produces repentance. Well, what is real repentance? It is a changed will that leads to a changed way. I change my way of thinking and then I change my way of acting. Jesus illustrated this. Matthew 21 verses 28 through 30 Jesus said, uh, tells a story about a father who had two sons. He said to his first son, son, go work in my field today. He said that he would, but he never went. Then he had a second son. He said, son, go work in my field today. He said, I'm not going to go. He changed his mind and went and worked in the father's field. And Jesus said, which of these did the will of the father? The one who said he wouldn't, changed his way of thinking, and then changed his way of acting and went and worked in the father's field. Luke chapter 3, verses 6 through 8, John said to the religious elite, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Repentance is not just a changed mind. It is a changed life that follows from a changed mind. And so you must repent to be saved. Fourth step, you must be willing to confess Jesus as the Son of God. Remember Acts chapter 8? Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are traveling down the road. Here's water. What doth hinder me? If you believe that with all your heart you may. And he says, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Acts 8, verse 36 and 37. I want you to notice Romans 10, verse 10 teaches that confession is essential to salvation. Look at what the Scripture says. The Bible says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth Confession is made unto salvation. Must I confess with my mouth to be saved? Absolutely. Jesus again said, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. And so I must confess Jesus as the Son of God. But there's one more step. The fifth step in God's plan of salvation is a person must be immersed into Christ for the remission of sins. There is so much confusion on the idea of baptism in our religious world, but it's not God's fault. God is clear concerning the fact that baptism is essential to salvation. Well, first of all, what is baptism? Is it sprinkling? Is it pouring? Is it immersion? We can know for a fact from Scripture that baptism is full body immersion. Four passages teach this. In John 3, verse 23, John was baptizing in Aenon near Salim because there was much water there. Of sprinkling, pouring, and full body immersion, which one takes much water? Only full body immersion. Romans 6, 1 through 4, Paul likens baptism to a burial. What happens at a burial? Well, you dig a hole in the ground. You place the body in the ground, and then you completely cover it on top. On bottom, on every side, and on top. The body is engulfed, immersed in the ground. That's the picture of baptism. A lot of people ask, well, what would Jesus do? Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 tells us, Jesus at His baptism, the Scripture says, and coming up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon Him like a dove. Question, to come up out of water, what must you first do? Go down into water. And don't you remember Acts 8, verses 37 through 39? They stopped the chariot. Both Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch got out of the water, out of the chariot. They both went down into the water. He baptized him, and they both came up out of the water. Why stop the chariot? Why both get out? Why both go down the water? Why both come up out of the water? Sprinkling and pouring don't require that. Full body immersion does. Well, if baptism is full body immersion, What's the purpose of baptism? So many people say baptism's not essential. It's an outward sign of an inward grace. So you're already saved. You just be baptized to identify. That's not what Scripture says. I want you to listen real carefully. The Scripture teaches baptism is essential to salvation. By that we mean a person is not saved a moment before he's baptized. Is that what the Scripture teaches? Listen to Jesus. Jesus made it so plain. He that believes and is baptized 
will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Did Jesus teach that belief and baptism were essential to salvation? You bet he did. Think about Saul's conversion. Saul was told, you go in the city, be told you what you must do. What was that must? Acts 22, 16. Ananias comes to him and says, Saul, Saul, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so baptism is essential to salvation. I want you to notice Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Here's what the scripture says. Acts 2 verse 38. The Bible says in response to the great question, Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What was the purpose of baptism? It was for the remission of sins in order to receive. Are we saying we earn salvation? Of course not. But does God say it's essential? Absolutely. Now someone says, well, you know, that's all good and well, but the Bible never says baptism saves. I beg your pardon, but it does. First Peter 3 verse 21 says that exactly. Peter said, baptism doth now also save us. Baptism saves. It is essential in God's plan of salvation. When someone says, okay, but the Bible never says I've got to be baptized to go to heaven. The Bible does say that. In John 3 verse 5, Jesus said, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. You can't get to heaven without being baptized. It is a command of God that I must obey to be right with Him. And so we ask you to think today. Stop for just a moment. And I want you to think about your own salvation. I want you to think where you were when you were saved. I want you to think about what steps you took. What did you do? Did someone tell you to say the sinner's prayer? Did someone tell you to lay your hand on the TV? What did you do? Where were you? How old were you? Now that you've drawn up your own salvation experience, let's examine it based on what we saw today. Did you hear the Word of God? Did you believe in Jesus as God's Son? Were you willing to repent of your sins? Did you make the good confession? And were you baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins? Friend, if you answered no to any of those, then we kindly say to you today, you are not saved. But here's the good news. You can be saved. You can be right with God. You can today obey the gospel and become a New Testament Christian. We're begging with you. We're pleading with you. Obey the gospel of Christ before it's everlastingly too late. Won't you do that today while you know the truth and while you know what is right? You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.